You're listening to We Deep in Media. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Deep In with Christina. I'm your host, Christina Weber, founder and CEO of We Deep In, feminine weapon, and also a certified professional coach and matchmaker. If you do enjoy this podcast, please do like, subscribe, rate it, give it five stars. It helps more people find it, helps me continue to record it. And while I do love sharing with you in this way and speaking to you and directly into your ears, what I love even more is being with you in real life and having shared experiences. So if you go to the calendar at wedeepen.com and you check out all the things that are upcoming, there's a ton of Tantra speed dates. And no, I won't be at all the Tantra speed dates. They're happening throughout the United States, Miami, Florida, Austin, Texas, Los Angeles, Milwaukee, St. Louis, Chicago, even Amsterdam and the UK and some places in Canada, the lucky ones there. Uh, So check those out. Those are experiences if you're currently single. I highly recommend that everybody check out a Tantra speed date just once. And maybe you go once and maybe your person isn't there because, wow, you've won the lottery if you meet them. But go for the practice of dating and romance and love. You'll also see on the calendar upcoming festivals, conferences, retreats. I love those multi-day experiences because they're immersive. You get to travel to a destination, be surrounded by growth-minded people. And these are all people who desire healthy, meaningful, loving relationships. That's essentially why I've curated these experiences um, based upon who the facilitators are, what the brands, uh, who are the brands are that are hosting those. They are epic, epic experiences, and we will continue to curate more of them for you. You might have also heard recently, no matter when you're listening to this podcast, We Deepen has launched a love club. It is a six month intimacy accelerator to amplify your intimacy journey. Uh, If you are currently single, this is the place for you as well. Uh, It is a cohort of 36 people each go around and we become each other's matchmakers. We also include comprehensive relationship education, uh, and we hold you accountable for your love goals. You know, where do you go? Is you know, we're out in the world. We have our career goals. We have maybe goals for our money, uh, but and maybe our family and how we get along with others and socialize. But this is really this is the, this is where you can go to say, raise your hand and say, I want a family, a companionship a healthy relationship. And we are a village of people that are becoming comrades for each other's love life. And we're going to rally for you. So check that out. You'll see, find that at wedeepen.com hit on the love club. If you're listening to this before December of 2023, our first cohort is about to take off. So definitely apply. And to note, I am very well aware that we're going to start this first cohort and I'm not going to want to wait until August of 2024 to send the second group of people into this rocket ship journey in their romantic life. Um, So there will be an opportunity for a rolling cohort. So check that out. And I'd love to have you join us in that. Right now, I'm recording this podcast right before the Wonderland Conference. Wonderland is coming up in Miami, Florida. It's November 9th through the 11th of 2023. It's an annual conference. So if you miss it this time, it's going to happen again. They are calling this the world's premier conference for psychedelic medicine, longevity, and mental health. And I have the honor of being on stage three times there. I'm facilitating a dating dojo, a playful portal, and a mind-blowing intimacy panel. The Mind Blowing Intimacy Panel is featuring three of these like powerful people in my life. And when I say powerful, I want to even dive deeper into that. They are so authentic in who they are as human beings. Aziza from Precious Little Ladies, she's been on this podcast before. Uh, her brother 
was a dear friend of mine who passed away in 2016. And Aziza has one of those stories of growing up that will make your mind blow. Um, for a woman who has experienced so much trauma and to be so fully embodied in her the in, in her being, the way that she moves through the earth. Um, if you even just go to her Instagram, I'll link it from here because I'm going to link all the facilitators who are on stage with me at the conference. Uh, you'll definitely have to check out Aziza's Instagram as well as Ken Page from Deeper Dating. He's going to be on stage with me and then Stell. And today's conversation is with Stell. You're going to get to meet her as we prepare to go on stage for the conference. Stell is a kink performer, a kink educator. Her and I got to collaborate through the Unbound Collective. She's one of the co-founders of the organization. They started by creating these Shabari sound healing journeys. And uh, and then they've they've created nightly experiences that take people into the eroticism, into kink, into ridding yourself from any shame that you may have for wanting to access taboos that may not be out in the world for people to, to see, to, 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 you know, who do you connect with around these taboos? Like they are eliminating the shame and they're Stell, it's so great to have you on Deepen with Christina. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Christina. And I will just say my pronouns are actually they, them, or daddy. Did I say I it? Know did I... I say you're she? Oh, I did say she. <gasps> <laughs> oh my goodness. It's so funny because when before we, we push record on this, I wanted to make sure that I got that correct. And I was thinking, I don't think that'll ever, we're going to have a two-way dialogue. I don't think that I'm ever going to talk about you in a way, if you're right here in front of me, that I would even use your pronouns. And there I did it. It happens. I know I'm, I'm quite femme presenting, so I know it happens really easily. Let's start. How did you even, you know, because the pronouns, if I rewind back, I'm, I'm 42. Pronouns weren't a thing until recent years. This wasn't something that my brain has been equipped to to process. So it's definitely, it's, it's, I'm in a learning curve around them. How did you come to, let's even just start. How did you come to create a pronoun and decide like, how, how did that be, how did that come through for you? Yeah, for sure. You know, for me for a while, I knew she, her wasn't right for me. And I was really holding off on they, them for a number of years and it wasn't feeling right. It wasn't feeling like it was the one that was landing for me. And then I think it was probably 2019, I said, you know what, I'm just going to go with a them for now as a placeholder, because it feels better than she, her for me. And, and it's become more comfortable in the meantime. So I, I, I think for me, it really started because I've never felt like a girl or like a woman. It just hasn't felt right for me ever to fully, fully say that that's who I am. And that's like the deepest embodied part of me. I was such a tomboy growing up and I'd have moments where it was a little bit girlier. So it was just always something that was more fluid for me. And so they, them just ultimately ends up feeling like it fits me much better than she, her. Hmm. I love that brings you back to your child. Who, who were you as a child? As a child? Yeah. Oh, that's such an interesting question. I definitely loved animals. I still do and nature. And I love to get out and get my hands dirty in the dirt. And then I also really love to get cleaned up and play and cook and do crafty kind of things. And these are pieces of me that were definitely who I was as a child and also who I am now. And I was, I was such a horse person. Horses were my world. I had goals of going to the Olympics. This was like my, my life. So there was like this aspect of like, when I'm showing it's get all cleaned up, be dressed perfectly, impeccably, everything looks really, really like it's just done to the T. And then there's also the aspect of mucking stalls and cleaning water buckets and all of the dirty, messy, muddy kind of things that have to do with horses. And that in a lot of ways still feels like it's who I am. Hmm. You and I got to work together for the 
Unba- with Unbound Collective. And we did a Boundless event in August of 2023 here in Austin, Texas. And I got to see that side of you. You are so pristine in how you organize and orchestrate in your work life. And the spaces that you hold are super safe. Um, I was, you know, especially doing kink work. um, There's all spectrums. I don't want to shame anybody, but there's all spectrums in the way that people orchestrate um, play spaces. And I found that you we're always there checking, you know, to make sure that everything was, you know, the consent, the consent um, protocol was printed out and it was on the walls that everybody was safe and everybody at moment and we timed it accurately. Um, and I think that that's, that shows how gifted you are to be ushering this work into the world, because it is definitely, we're, we're in a, we're in a transitional phase is where people are opening up more to the erotic side of themselves and also as a collective. And I think there's a lot of fear around that. Um, I I had a phone call earlier today with a group here in Austin that's planning a New Year's party. It's a kinky New Year's party. And they set all of their you know, their text message list up um, with a, you know, a text processor and they got kicked off Mm. the day that they they spent all this time getting it all orchestrated. And then the text message service looked further into what the first party is that they were going to promote. And we're like, "Uh uh-uh, we're not doing it. Uh, Go, go do your business elsewhere. And that's happening. Mm. I've seen that with credit card processors. And, and it's so, it's so interesting to me because it's, I, I, we, in, in working in the world of relationships, I see this big opening that's happening. So many more people interested. I've, I've been talking about this trend in the play party space on this podcast. I've had the founders of kinky rabbit club and Kimmy inch, um, who's a pro dominatrix and also a kink educator and, uh, um, Yosef Sagi from mystery temple. And so it's, we're seeing this like rise of people even working in this profession, yet the 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 structures or the the systems in our world are like, nope, nope, we don't want it. But there's such a high demand for it. Such a high demand for it. Uh, so thank you. Thank you for for doing what you're doing and holding these these safe spaces. How, you know, before I, I want to get to like how you got into this work, but can you speak to a little bit about of what your intentionality and in, like, what is it in you that drives these spaces to be so different from the others and so safe? Yeah. Well, it's interesting that you use the word safe. I actually don't like using the word safe at all. I like to use the word safer because I think of safety as something that I can't ensure for anyone and nobody can ensure for anyone else. And it's something that we have to co-create together and something that we're really all responsible for looking out for one another in. And for me, it really comes down to creating spaces that foster a place for people to connect heart to heart and to really land in with one another. For me, it's really important that intimacy is something that is soulful, that it's something that's reverent, that it's something that brings deeper meaning and deeper connection to people. It's a place where people can be their authentic selves and really drop into the magic of what it means to be human. And then from there, that that just opens up so many ways to play and just opens up so much space for expansion and and beauty in life. And that really has to come from creating a container where the aspects of the container are clear and we are creating a a safer container together. And uh, yeah, that's, it's, it's really something that like the beauty and the, and the safety we're creating that safer container go hand in hand for me. Did you see unsafe things out in the world in this space? I have certainly seen lots of unsafe things. 
you know, whether it's like bio containment, I was at a couple of events this weekend, a couple of kink events these last two weekends and there's spaces Did you go to where DomCon? I didn't go to DomCon. No, no. I, you know, I have had many years where I've wanted to go and I've been out of the country or I've been traveling or there's been different reasons and I haven't been, but I was at a couple of different events these last couple of weekends and spaces where they have protocol around things like biocontainment, like no bare bottoms on any of the public surfaces. And there I'm seeing bare bottoms on all the public surfaces, or there was, there was one event, uh, where basically a lot of folks were tied up and blindfolded and other people could come around and touch them. And then they had a rule of, if you're touching anyone's genitals, make sure to change gloves. Okay. So that seems like a good rule. But the other thing that was happening was that there was a lot of dripping cocks. Can I say cocks on here? You can say cocks. <laughs> Cock okay, there dips, were a lot of whatever. there were a lot of dripping cocks. Maybe there were other dripping genitals too, but I saw a lot of cocks literally dripping right onto the carpet. And then I'm looking at that and I'm like, that is that's just nope. <laughs> that is not the kind of container I want to create where everybody's sexual fluids are all over the place. So there's for me, there's there's the aspect of keeping things contained and bioaware and also being mindful of of folks' hearts and their sensitivities and their traumas and whatever it is that they're bringing to the space. And when those pieces are established and set up and people are really able to just drop into one another, to me, that's where the magic happens. And and those are the kind of spaces I want to create more of in the world. Mm. It's crazy that you were at multiple kink events in the past couple of weeks while DomCom was going on, I imagine it had to be DomCom because <laughs> how many kink events could be happening throughout the world? But those were in San Francisco, the events? I was in the Bay Area. Yeah, yeah, I was in the Bay Area. I hear San Francisco is very kinky. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's such a hub. It really is. Like when I think of so many of the kink educators that are here and so much history here and so many organizations that were started here. And yeah, it really it's a hub. It's definitely a sex positive, kinky, polyamorous hub. How did you get into this? You know, it's interesting. I'm from the Bay Area originally. And growing up, I didn't really like the Bay Area. I don't like the winters. It's cold. I like warm tropical weather. I didn't necessarily get on with the culture of the Bay Area that much. And I also grew up in a really what I call sex negative household. And I moved away, went to school, was um, living abroad quite a bit, traveling a lot. And then I really was doing a lot of work on myself because I had a lot of sexual healing to do. And for me, that first started uh, with a lot of Tantra, a lot of Neo Tantra, a lot of White Tantric, a lot of different uh, Tantra traditions. And then that ultimately at some point uh, was still a part of me. And I, I was finding myself involved in different groups and um, actually through contact improv, which is a dance modality. I was traveling around the world, going to different contact improv festivals. And I went to my first play party. And at this play party, there was a BDSM room. There was a couple different rooms. One of them was a BDSM room. And I went in there with somebody I was playing with and there was something simple on the side table, like paddles and maybe a crop or something. We both kind of looked at it and looked at each other like, whoa, okay, no, we're not ready for that. And then another uh, couple came in and they started playing with the paddles. And then we looked at each other again and we were, we both had the same look of, oh, wait, that actually kind of looks fun. And maybe that's not so bad. And it was just that simple opening up. And then I just skyrocketed and, and kept diving deeper and deeper and went deeper with play partners and started taking different workshops and learning different types of play. And just, oh, I dove headfirst into it. And then it all started to make so much more sense to me in terms of other aspects of my life, in terms of how I was with previous partners and uh, what my turn-ons were and what my kinks are. And I just, I just started to discover and uncover myself in such a way that I hadn't before. 
And in a way that so many things started making so much more sense for me. And this is, you're in your 20s as this is happening? Yeah. Yeah. It was the end of my 20s. Yeah. When you say play partners, what does that mean? What's a play partner? So I, for myself, consider play partners to be people that I will play with, but perhaps aren't a penetrative play partner. I guess I'll differentiate like a lover for me as maybe someone who I'm penetratively intimate with, or there is like this act of what, whatever I might, or they might want to define as, as full penetrative sex. And then play partners can be separate in the sense of it can be quite intimate and quite, uh, quite physically connected even, but perhaps there isn't penetration. Maybe there isn't any fluid bonding. Maybe there isn't even genital touch can be, can be different. And it's still at the same time can be so juicy and so erotic. How do you differentiate who should be a play partner and who should be a lover? Mm, I love this question. I love it so much. So for me, it's really a feeling that comes from deep embodiment and deep presence to myself and deep listening to myself. And from there, I take that as my sign of how close do I want to be to this person or how far away do I want to be from this person? What activities, what, what types of play do I want to have with this person? And what types of play do I not want to have with this person? I have a friend and every time I see them, we have this really, really juicy chemistry. And then we'll get closer and closer and closer until we're literally probably an inch from each other's face. And it just oh, dies for me. I'm like, nope, that's not where it is. It's not that continuous pull into them that I feel when I'm playing with them or we're dancing or we're cuddling or we're petting each other or we're tying each other or we're doing other kinds of play. As soon as I get to that place of I'm almost going to kiss them, I recognize immediately, no, nope, this isn't where it is for them. With me, with me, it's not there for them. And it's not there with them. That is, you know, it, this is such a, a great topic to unpack because I find as I'm doing love club interviews, so we're onboarding this first cohort into the love club and I'm talking to them a lot about their relational life and the process and something that has come up with some men, particularly, they are curious about what it is that creates more of the, the deeper bond, allows them to go deeper with a woman. Like, because I imagine it's not, I want to reframe rejection because there, there quite possibly could, it could be interpreted as a level of rejection, but it could also be interpreted as like, I like just the idea of like an energetic that is orchestrating a divine construct between me and you in the right, in, 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 in its right formula. And I imagine that this particular play partner, correct me if I'm wrong, but he may, if you were to say, yes, if you didn't stop right there, as it got to this, you know, close point, he might go all in. And I think, you know, you can, like, I, I, from a, from a, 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 a cock person, a, a human with a cock, they're looking for a hole to stick the cock into. So it's the, you know, the, the, the one who has the hole is like, you can enter or don't enter, you know, we give the permission to it. What would you say? Like, do you have these conversations to really explain it? Is there even words? Sometimes maybe it's, there might not even be words. It might not, it's just a feeling like I love how we are as is. And this is as deep as that we're going. Like, how does one know? Because it can be, I think it can be very confusing for a man at times. <laughs> I'm, I'm almost laughing because I'm like, well, how do you know it was a man I was talking about, Christina? <laughs> true, true. Good, great point. Great point. It, it was in this, in this, in this instance, it was, but it's not always. So I was just laughing to myself a little. And then, and then I think there's also the place too, for me, uh, because I love pegging so much that 
I'm also thinking, oh, for a man to put his cock into something. And I'm thinking, well, what about me when I want to put my cock into something? And, and that's, that's a whole, I mean, my energetic cock, you know, it feels like my cock and it's, oh yeah, it's, it's a feeling. And it's interesting for me too, uh, to break it up into, into those kind of pieces of, of who is the cock holder and, and who is, who is the one penetrating and who is the one being penetrated. And as someone who does both, I, I recognize the difference in myself sometimes of when I am being penetrated and the the sensitivities I have that come up around that versus when I am penetrating and how there feels like there is a less of a degree of, of intimacy or investment into the connection. And it can certainly be there you know, without any penetration, there can be deep investment and deep intimacy. And I do notice in myself that, that I am so much more flowery and so much more tender when I'm being penetrated than, than when I'm not to the point where I literally will not have someone penetrate me who has not been penetrated before, because I think they honestly do not have so much valuable information that I would need somebody who who would be penetrating me to have. And I've seen it time and time again with my partners that have been penetrated, how uh, tender and caring they'll be after penetrating me and how understanding they are and how much they, they know that side of, of the interaction. You know, going into this recording, we knew that there's some information that you carry that is very sacred. Um, and we'll reserve it to discuss at a later time, but you brought up pegging. (laughs) One of my favorite activities. (laughs) Can we talk? We can talk about that. Oh, (laughs) let's, you know, oh gosh, am I going to reveal this? I had my first pegging, um, encounter this past year and I, and, and if you would have eight months ago, eight, nine months ago, I would have said, I would never do that. Never, mm. never going to peg anybody, not interested. I'm dating somebody who's interested in that. They can go find that elsewhere. I'm not going to do it. And then I did in 2023 and I loved it. I really like, I cannot imagine being in a relationship with somebody and maybe, I don't know what the future holds, but there's some level of openness that Mm -hmm. and depth that you can go with somebody else that you can't when they're, they're unwilling, they're unwilling to go. Like, I want to explore, I want to explore all the depths that intimacy has available and to be able to, you know, put a strap on, on me and, feel like that energy of that level of, I don't even know if I want to say it's a level of control, but it's almost having the ability to pleasure somebody in a way that you can't do otherwise. Hmm. It's, it's like the act of penetration is literally soul penetrating, whether, whether folks want to recognize it or not. So to me, when I, when you're saying it's, it's something that, that can't happen. Otherwise I completely get it on that level. I completely get it on the level of it's penetrating deeply, intimately into them and connecting with a really deep part of them physically and spiritually and emotionally. Can you tell your first pegging story? Oh, my first pegging story. I had actually quite the experience uh bottom for my first <laughs> pegging <laughs> where it, it wasn't just pegging it was literally my whole hand and my whole fist then working up both of my hands together then both of my fists <laughs> and i just looked at my hands after like they were these precious 
golden healing tools. Like I fell deeply in love with my hands after that experience. And, uh, yeah, it was, it was so special to me because it was, yes, the intimacy of everything else that we'd experienced. And it was like from zero to 80, at least maybe a hundred for some people, like within such a short amount of time, it was so, so intense. And it was somebody I, I think something else that made it really precious for me is it was somebody that I was uh, new to meeting and probably the the person that I just came into the deepest, fastest love feeling for ever. Like it was, it was such a whirlwind. Everything was such a whirlwind for me. And first uh, we were intimate and I noticed that when we were intimate and we played with anal and me receiving anal, how tender and caring they were and they knew to set a bath for me and light candles for me and massage me after and completely take care of me. They knew the important steps after anal of of how sensitive I was going to be because they experienced it. And so then when, when that switch and they were the bottom for me, it was like this whole magic precious opening for us to share together. And, and now I got to hold them in that place. And it was, yeah, it was really magical, really magical. How does, well, did this partner of yours, did they request this type of play? And how do you also prepare? Because you, I mean, you can't just take the hands and shove them up the anus. Like, how does, how did, how do you prepare to even enter someone in that way? Yeah. So they were really quite experienced. So they knew how to clean themselves out and they knew also how to prepare themselves and open themselves up. And they gave me a bit of instruction, uh, in terms of like how fast to go or how slow to go. I also, truth be told, have like quite a bit of experience playing with my own ass too. And I think it's really important. I think it was a a partner probably when I was in my twenties was telling me about how, um, there's, there's practices. I think it's Montauk Chia who's, who says the importance of daily anal massage. And so I'd really taken that practice on myself. So I already knew that and had that practice myself and knew the importance of going slowly and opening up the quadrants and circling and and going gently and not pushing things. And so when my partner was then sharing with me or kind of guiding me into them, I already knew that this was like a really tender place for my own experience of myself. And then also for my own experience of having received anal before from other partners too. So I could just really be there and really be patient and slow and, and let them almost sit on to me versus me come into them. And I think that's a really important thing to do whenever I'm playing with somebody, especially for the first time, I usually have them come on to me instead of me penetrating into them because then they can gauge themselves. I might help open them up by, by circling, uh, by stretching the sphincters open, uh, by offering, some external stimulation first really gently, but, but really ultimately, I think it's so important that the, the partner who's going to be the one being penetrated is the one who's guiding that initial penetration at the very least. Mm. And I like that practice too. If it's, if it's vulvic penetration too. I I, thank you for going in to this vulnerable conversation and speaking about this publicly. Um, I I do have a friend colleague that she guides women to explore their anus. And when I did ask her if she would come on and do a podcast with me about it, she's like, ah, I do that more in like women's circles. <laughs> um, I'm not necessarily talking about that publicly. I'm not quite sure just yet. So yeah, most people I don't think know that this is available and there's probably a little bit of cringing happening to some people who are listening right now in the moment. It's sort of that, tr- I don't even want to call this stuff trend because this is not trends. Um, these are just things that 
are taboo and haven't been talked about. So because they haven't been talked about, you don't believe that they're happening and the people who maybe are doing it must be cuckoo. Um, but mm-hmm. the, you know, I've, <laughs> I've in the past when heard that pure blood is great for your skin and, uh, mm-hmm. and you can take your period blood and rub it all over your face. And I've, I've done that before I've done it. And it, it's felt great in regards to, I don't have much experience with my own anus. And you said <laughs> something that there is a, a spiritual enlightened being who's speaking to the power of uh, massaging the anal and what what is that and and also too because we're speaking at a psychedelic conference coming up is there a correlation to the healing or the um or is it just is like a relaxing is it like this is a massage or is it something deeper than that so <clears throat> for me it's something deeper certainly even when I do enemas, coffee enemas or whatever other kind of enema I'm doing, it's a deep emotional release for me. It's a place of tracing back through so much of my own life experience and deeply releasing. Like I think Freud was really on to something in his in his theories around how we have different stages that relate to different parts of our lives and different uh, parts of our being that relate to different stages of our lives. And for me, the anal exploration really, really is a deeply emotional place. And it's a, a place where whenever I experience anything anal, it feels so tender and so precious. And, and I, I end up being in a really flowery place. I think that honestly, you know, you were sharing about, oh yeah, that this might be a bit of a taboo subject to talk about. And even somebody who's leading women in anal massage workshops isn't, isn't wanting to come out and share about it uh, on the podcast publicly. And I honestly think that like, we need to release the taboo on it and we really need to share about it because it's, it's something that is the gateway to so much magic and so much pleasure. I. I really value teachers who've, who've taught on it, like Joseph Kramer, for example, that's another, another Bay area teacher who I think it was even in the nineties, he started, he started teaching on anal massage and things that were so taboo. And I look at him and I'm like, well, bless you. Thank you so much for leading that way. And his courses are incredible. He was like the predecessor to sexological body work and, um, he, he, he still educates on that and just does it so comfortably. And I, I love that. And I think that's so important. And then there's, I mean, there certainly are practices around anal massage that span all around the world and, and, and different ways to do it. And I think that there's really something there and, and how it not just brings someone into a, a a really tender place, but also when it's shared with a partner brings them to a place of really deep connection and, and, and deeply sacred place together. Mm. What would you say to somebody who was like an absolute no to this? Like, no, I'll never do it. Oh, I'd say get over yourself. (laughs) (laughs) Um, What would I say? Honestly? Okay. I would, I'd want to know like what their, what their reservations are. I'd want to know, uh, you know, it could be that there's some, some trauma there. It could be that there's some fear there or some social conditioning there. I would, you know, usually when people say that they don't want to play with their ask, I, you know, to each their own, honestly, to each their own. And I would still invite and encourage at least personal exploration just to see if there's something there. Because I do think that there's a lot of cultural stigma around uh, any anal kind of play. And then people might, might fear around, have fear around bacteria and these kind of things. And I mean, honestly, 
there's gloves, there's, there's barriers that people can use to, to mitigate some of the, the biohazard risks that they might potentially be concerned about. There's a, you know, protocol that someone could put in place in terms of maybe don't play with your ass directly on your pillow that you're going to then sleep on. You know, there's, there's ways to, to still do it in a safer way that, that might alleviate some of the concerns that people might have. I had no clue that we were going to talk about this today. (laughs) (laughs) One of my favorite subjects. I didn't know we were going to chat about it either. I know the conversation just went there and I'm so grateful because it's interesting before we, we started recording, you and I were doing a dance about what we're willing to talk about and how we frame it because it's what society really ready for. And then this unfoldment happened. So thank you for being willing to discuss it because this is mind blowing. This is intimate. (laughs) We'll see if this is what is part of the topic at on the stage at the Wonderland (laughs) conference. If you are at Wonderland conference and you are listening, maybe we'll talk about it. Maybe we won't. We'll have to, uh, we'll, we'll figure that, figure that out as we go. But if you are interested in more diving into this topic, please do let me know. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> what are you most excited about the wonderland conference oh gosh i think you know honestly getting to have more time with you it's going to be amazing getting to meet aziza i love the work that she's done I, her story is so incredible i have had communication with her as un, unbound you know her organization, Precious Little Ladies, is one of the organizations we donate to, and I haven't met her in person, so I'm really looking forward to that. There's also some some great speakers uh, around aspects of ceremony and ritual and sacredness of of medicines, and that all interests me. That all interests me for sure, being involved in that kind of community where most people are recognizing the the magic that can be had by one feeding their body and fueling their body with medicines, whatever it is, if it's a medicine of a plant or a chemical compound or sex, neuroticism, whatever that is, that that all interests me. Mm. Last question for you. Mm-hmm. What is it like to date as a kink educator? Oh, <laughs> it's interesting. And so I actually went on what I thought was going to be a vanilla date last night. And it wasn't at all. <laughs> somehow, somehow the conversation ended up segueing into kink and then I I just surrendered I said okay it's just it's just such a part of me it radiates out of every part of my being that of course it would come and it actually was beautiful when the date segued into that because then it it came into a place where I feel so comfortable because before that I was I found myself kind of titrating in the conversation what pieces can I drop in and feeling the person out, what are they comfortable with me talking about? Because for some people talking about kink can be really edgy, really uncomfortable. It could bring up trauma. It can, it can be so many things. So it was actually quite relieving when then we were just able to have a conversation about kink and, and chat about our kinks and what we enjoy. And and then it just felt so natural. Yeah. I'd, I'd say the short of it is dating as a kink educator is amazing when I'm connecting with folks who are comfortable chatting about kink and is very much a situation of me feeling out the situation when I don't really know who I'm talking to Mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm wanting to gauge where they are. I do think people a lot of times are confused about what kink is. People will say to me all the time, Oh, I'm not kinky. And I'm like, do you like to play? (laughs) Like, mm-hmm. yeah, of course I like to play. I'm like, that's what kink is. It's playing. Yeah. It's role playing. It's trying new three things and being creative in the bedroom or in your intimate life. I had a partner who said, who would consistently say that they're not kinky. 
and they just do it for me. But they would come up with the most amazing ideas that I absolutely loved. And we'd have so much fun together. And I'm like, okay, you know what? Say what you want to say. Say you're not kinky, if that's how it feels to you. And I personally would not tell myself I'm not kinky if I was coming up with such incredible ideas. What was your favorite idea that he came up with? (laughs) Oh, there were so many. Um, Some of them that were really cute were like, he, he wanted me to pee on him while he was inside of me or wanted to pee inside of me while he was inside of me. Can you even do that? <laughs> Is that possible? It's so possible. We totally did it. <laughs> I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't know because a hard dick can't pee, can it? Apparently it can. <laughs> Fascinating. How'd that feel? It was so funny. It was like, oh, wow, I'm like flooding with warm, warm liquid. He also, this this particular partner had an incredible capacity to literally sleep hard in me all night long. Not just once, but like he could do it like time and time and time and time again. Like he had, he did have a, a pretty miraculous cock. That's so fascinating. <laughs> and I guess the, you know, the, 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 peeing while inside of you is has to be such a novel experience we only live once why not try it all oh yeah I have so much fun with some of the weird things that I get to do like honestly that it just feels like so freeing and so liberating and so so much fun I get to laugh so much you know, I, years ago, I went to my first Cambo ceremony, which mm-hmm. is where they take the toad poison and they burn it to your skin or they burn your skin and they lay it on there. And then us around the room were, uh, you know, it, it's essentially they're, they're, we're, we're poisoning ourselves to alleviate the toxins in our body because it forces you to then puke. Everyone's like, you put their puke buckets and then we throw up. And I remember looking around the room that day and thinking, what is wrong with us? We're all insane. <laughs> I'm like crazy. But it is those experiences that transcend some type of limitation that we didn't even think was possible and make life like our own unique movie. You know, rather mm. than sitting back where so many people are watching, you know, other people live these realities that we live on the TV when they can just walk outside of their house and everything is available to them and you get to adventure and discover and explore and test. I mean, that's even what play is all about. It's like experimenting. Does this cause me stress? Does this excite me? What happens when I overcome this? Can I really do that? Take the pegging. For example, for me, I was like, I'll never do that. And it really did take, it was love. It was love that I felt to actually want to, because I got to a place where I was, I knew that the partner I was with enjoyed that. And because I was growing a love with this human that I wanted to have that experience with him. I wanted to share that. I wanted to feel into it. So these, I imagine all these actions and I know you, and that's why I can say this, Everything, all of this is coming from a place of love. Oh, yeah, completely. Completely. It's to me, it's like we get to to dive into these worlds together where there's so many less limits and go deep together. And and that is that's love Mm. going deep together, intimately deep together, intimately like heart to heart being to being soul to soul, like take down the walls, take down the walls. Thank you, Stell, so much for being a colleague, for doing this work together, for your willingness to blow our mind with your deep level of authenticity. I am so excited to share the stage with you coming up before we close. Is there anything that you want to make sure our listeners know about you? Anything coming up that you want to share? Hmm. Well, yeah, I'll be at Wonderland with you in Miami, which I'm really looking forward to. 
And uh, we'll also be having some unbound events coming up for Basel Week in Miami again. And folks can find out more about that on our Instagram, Unbound Ritual, or our website, unboundritual.com. You can also find me on Instagram. I've had three Instagram accounts deleted now, so now I'm starting my fourth. It's fem, F-E-M-M underscore daddy on Instagram. I haven't put much energy into it, honestly, because I don't know when it will get deleted next, but anyone can connect with me there and... Yeah, reach out if there's any questions or, you know, I love hearing people's erotic stories. And I think sometimes just for folks to know that there are others they can laugh and chat and communicate about their erotic adventures with can be really supportive. And so just just know that I'm certainly a place for that. And uh, yeah, I, I just want to invite dropping the shame, dropping the stigma and for everyone to just feel like they are allowed to be themselves, you know, allowed to be themselves. And there are other people who want to want to explore and play in the same ways that you do. And it's just a matter of finding who those people are. It might not be everyone, but they do exist out there. Mm. Thank you. I'm going to link all of that in the description of this podcast. So you can hit directly to Stell's Instagram, as well as the Unbound Ritual Instagram. And uh, hopefully we see you at Wonderland. Thank you so much, Stell. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in to another episode of Deep In with Christina. Again, if you do enjoy this podcast, please do like, subscribe, rate, give it five stars. Helps more people find it. Helps me continue to host it. Also, check out the Love Club. Come and join us. You can go to wedeepin.com, click on the Love Club, or direct access is right at wedeepinloveclub.com. Thank you all. Bye for now. I love you. Thanks, Christina.